Hi there, my name is Coach Carmen Bott. I'm an athlete performance specialist in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and I specialize um, in working with athletes at, in wrestling at a world level and with uh, professional and amateur gridiron football. And today I wanna to talk to you about jet lag and travel fatigue. So I think we could probably all agree that um, you know jet lag is a real phenomena that um, even travel fatigue from being on a on a bus on a long road trip is certainly something that uh, athletes have to contend with. So I'll begin the talk by identifying the problem, you know, sort of talking about that elephant in the room, and then I'm going to go into just some quick science on biological clocks and circadian rhythms, just to give you some background information. But the main bulk of the webinar today will be around some really simple solutions. Um, and strategies that you maybe as an athlete or a coach can follow uh, to help um, athletes adapt as quickly as possible to new time zones and, and uh, things of that nature. So let's get going. Obviously elite athletes itineraries can place pretty, pretty huge demands on them, right? And it can place physiological demands, but it can also place psychological demands, especially when athletes are dealing with multi time zone travel. Now, if you live in a country like the USA or Canada, you know, we're really separated by uh, three or four time zones. So it's really not as drastic when we're traveling, you know, with our own nations, you know, from west to east or east to west, as it would be, you know, traveling to North America or traveling to South, um, sorry, to South America or traveling over to Europe or even, you know, across the globe to Asia or Australia, New Zealand. So, um, you know, we have to obviously consider that there's going to be different demands placed on athletes depending on how, you know, how far they're going. So I'm going to start with uh, just sort of generally talking about uh, jet lag and travel fatigue and, and some of the causes of um, the symptoms that athletes face. Jet lag, travel fatigue are real. So we, you know, we can't tell athletes to suck it up if they've been on a bus for 10 hours, so, you know, in a cramped posture, and then, you know, all of a sudden has to uh, get to a field and, and compete and maybe even practice at a high level. So we need to be aware of um, some of the ramifications of, of that. Um, we also need to be aware of any psychological stressors that might be associated with travel, like losing your luggage or, or time delays in airports. Um, or even the stress of almost missing a connecting flight. I mean, I've been there. That's extremely uh, stressful, you know, sprinting across an airport that maybe you're not completely familiar with either. So that all sort of adds to um, what we'd call sort of the restorative timeline when an athlete does arrive at their, their destination. Another thing we need to consider are, you know, things like hypoxia, which is the reduction in, in oxygen availability in the air cabin and dehydration. And those are just both due to dry cabin air. So obviously due to travel, many athletes have suffered some sort of physiologic disturbance and any symptoms that are, you know, associated with that. And they can include, you know, fatigue, disorientation, headaches, travel weir weariness. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, of different symptoms sort of depending on the, the individual but they're definitely not in that individual's head. So interventions um, are great, you know, um, those that are really rich in evidence tend to be a bit elusive. And I did dive into this area when I was doing my research for this talk, but decided, you know, not to really go too deep because um, we actually have a lot of difficulty as scientists measuring and monitoring circadian rhythms. And you probably wonder, well, what exactly are circadian rhythms? So let me, let me give you a few Cole's notes on those. They're really physical, mental, and, and behavior changes that follow a daily cycle. So typically sort of a 24 to 26 hour cycle. And our circadian rhythms respond to light and dark. So that's why, you know, when it starts getting dark at night, we might actually start to feel sleepy. And while we want to sleep at the night, in the nighttime, and maybe not uh, during the day. So sleeping at night and, and being awake during the day is an example of a light-related circadian rhythm. Okay, so we have many different circadian rhythms in the body. 
Now you're probably maybe curious about this idea of having a biological clock and if that's the same as a circadian rhythm. Well, they're not the same, but they are related. Biological clocks produce circadian rhythms and you know re regulate their timing essentially. So these rhythms actually help determine our sleep patterns and that's the relevant piece for today's talk. The body's master clock really controls the production of melatonin and that master clock is found in the brain and we're actually not going to get into the neurophysiology of that but it controls the release and production of, of melatonin which is a hormone that makes you sleepy so our body does produce that naturally and it it also receives information about incoming light from our eyes right from the optic nerves which relayed that information to the brain so when there's less light like at night the clock tells the brain hey you know what Let's make some melatonin and let's go to sleep. So that's just some quick notes on sort of biological clocks and circadian rhythms. Now, some of the interventions that I looked at were really impractical. You know, if you, if you ask an athlete to adjust to um, a time zone ahead of time, you know, in their home country, you know, then they're going to miss training. They're going to be eating at weird times. They're going to be up in the middle of the night. It just doesn't seem to be that you know practical or feasible but we do need some type of management strategy you know for high performance athletes and we need do need to appreciate the physiological effects of travel through different time zones so let's look at jet lag and then let's look at the term travel fatigue because they are a little bit different uh, jet lag is a syndrome of symptoms Okay, so you're probably thinking, all right, well, what do I feel like when I feel jet lagged, right? I feel disorientated, I feel, um, you know, sleepy, I might feel wide awake at the most inappropriate times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a syndrome of symptoms that are caused by a shift into a new time zone. So you can't suffer from jet lag if you're in the same t time zone, according to Samuels. So it's very pronounced when we cross multiple time zones. And that's basically due to the mismatch between your body clock, which we just talked about, and whatever the new local time is. Now, um, jet lag is essentially when your circadian rhythms are just out of whack. Okay, And one thing to note is that it can resolve approximately at a rate of one day per time zone. So if you're traveling 10 time zones and you're competing like two days later, you're going to need to do some things to help you adjust to that time zone a little bit quicker because jet lag isn't just about sleeplessness it's also characterized by you know gi disturbance sleep disturbance as i just mentioned fatigue impaired concentration low motivation um, and obviously all those things impact sport performance now travel fatigue tends to accumulate and it can accumulate over the total um, competitive season for athletes. So with football players, for example, at the varsity level, these guys will, you know, tr maybe travel um, every single weekend um, for a whole month straight and not be at home and be on long bus rides, have to do homework. So we need to just be aware that that's going to cause some level of, a of fatigue simply because accumulation. Okay, so that's the kind of the key word there, accumulation. And it's important to, to actually have some type of monitoring process with athletes that are traveling on um, long trips and are sort of in an in-season sort of situation, you know, like NBA players, NHL, and they've got 80 plus games a season. Travel fatigue is probably more real to them than jet lag per se, okay? So, you know, what is travel fatigue characterized by? Well, the athletes will start to feel persistently tired. They may have re recurrent illness, like viruses that keep cropping up, any changes in behavior and mood, and loss of motivation. So this probably sounds a lot like overtraining syndrome, doesn't it? And it's interesting because overtraining syndrome is a very um, vague construct. It doesn't really sort of pinpoint exactly you know what the symptoms are or what even leads up to that but we can kind of assume that you know it, it's really that grind and not enough recovery periods for the the amount of load and we have to consider and appreciate that travel is load okay and and when we're load monitoring athletes we need to keep that you know in mind so both jet lag and travel fatigue reduce the athlete's ability to recover and perform I mean, don't worry, this isn't the end of the day. This is all part of sport, 
right? It's also part of, part of life. If you're a business executive, you may have to travel. That's why I'm going to go through some things to sort of ensure that you, maybe you're not going to suffer as much as, you know, somebody else. And you certainly don't want to suffer, hopefully, as much as your opponent, right? So there's key factors that have been identified, though, that make some of these symptoms worse. And uh, we're going to look at that right now. So these are considerations. We need to look at when we travel, what direction are we going if we're traveling across multiple time zones? So maybe greater than four time zones. Are we going east or are we going west? That seems to play uh, a role. I'll look at that in a moment. Um, how many time zones are we crossing? Are we crossing more than nine time zones? That's going to have a significant impact. So it, it really is you know, co sort of correlated. The more time zones you cross, the more of an impact that's going to have on performance. How frequent are you traveling? You know, I have wrestlers that do travel internationally to tournaments uh, to keep it compete. You know, they travel to world championships, maybe Olympics. They travel to um, major ranking tournaments, but these are usually only four times, five times, six times per year. You know, so we can athletes, you know, competing at that level and traveling that distance can, af you know, they can do it. They can recover because they're not doing that once a month. We also need to look at the length of the competitive season. I mentioned that earlier. You know, are we dealing with 80 games a season or are we dealing with 12? You know, but what does the level of stress look like for that particular sport? How many minutes are they playing, et cetera, et cetera. It's all cumulative. So these all impact the recovery window. Interestingly enough, in my research, we found that, um, or I found that symptoms of jet lag and travel fatigue are generally felt more acutely after going east. Okay, so that might be something that we want to take into consideration when we're actually looking at interventions. We also found that sleep deprivation altogether impacts the magnitude and duration of jet lag symptoms. So let's imagine, you know, a student athlete pulls an all nighter for an exam, writes the exam, gets on a flight, um, you know, sleeps a couple hours on the flight, ends up in a new time zone, you know, and is completely out of, out of whack and, and very fatigued. So, they're already behind the eight ball. So what is this telling you? It's probably telling you to do something ahead of time, right? So if we have a cumulative sleep deprivation moving into um, a trip, um, travel where we're either, you know, confined on a bus for a long period of time, or we are, you know, on an airplane and crossing many time zones, that's going to affect things in a big way. As I mentioned earlier, it does appear that one of the most effective strategies is pre-trip adaptation to the destination time zone. Well, for athletes, that's highly impractical. You know, that would require, you know, again, doing practices at two o'clock in the morning if necessary in local time, et cetera. So we really do need some guidelines um, um, for interventions that can be translated into compact recommendations to be a practical benefit to athletes, to be feasible for athletes and their sports science staff. So it seems that, um, you know, that's, sort of the key theme here and we'll we'll delve into that a little bit further now perhaps before i move on i will mention though that if you are a sports science advisor and listening to this pod um, cast slash webinar you you do need to do your due diligence even if you're a strength and conditioning coach working with a professional athlete and you don't have you're not surrounded by academics and physiologists you do have some responsibility to understand the body's clock, okay, to understand the physiology behind circadian re um, rhythms and how the central nervous system operates with the endocrine system and what we know about, you know, the influence of melatonin release and, and body temperature. We also, you also need to find out, you know, how influential light is on circadian rhythms. And that light actually does influence the secretion of melatonin and, and also the regulation of body temperature. And my final point is that when female athletes are traveling great distances, because it does affect the biological clock, it's important that uh, female athletes keep track of their menstrual cycle. So that way, any um, absence of a period, which is amenorrhea, is, is also documented. So my advice would be to you know, do some reading in this area and look up the, um, the citations I've provided you, but to work with a sports medicine doctor. 
to come up with a light therapy program. And we'll get into that in a little bit um, in a sec. All right. So we're going to talk now to finish up about this idea of a travel management plan. And what I've done here is divided travel into three periods. We've got pre-flight strategy or even pre-long bus ride, an in-flight strategy and a post-flight um, upon arrival type type uh, strategy before a trip begins it's probably worth doing some sleep history on athletes and what I do as a performance coach is have my athletes um, keep a journal right and some of them keep a more formal journal other pe others use you know something that I've provided to them but sleep is documented daily quality as well as quantity of sleep and so we get an idea of an athlete's sleep habits if we have an athlete that is struggling with sleep at home, it's going to be harder for them to adapt when they're on the road and they've been traveling across time zones. So that's important to, um, to know. All right. So that's that sleep history log prior to travel to determine an athlete's sleep habits. All right. This was just retrieved from Google. It's just an FYI. If you want to have a look here at the standard time zone. So it's color coded. I really like this image. It gives you a really good idea when you look at different places in the world, um, how many time zones, you know, you're crossing to get to different areas. So I'm in Vancouver, which is uh, the fourth one from the left in green. And if I travel to Australia, I'm actually traveling one, two, three, uh four five six seven eight or nine um time zones okay so and i'm traveling east if, if i am flying because that's the direction um that the airplane goes last uh, year i went to poland and traveled one two three four five six seven eight nine ten uh tr time zones sorry nine time zones so the same number of time zones but i traveled west Okay, so I'll give you some intel sort of on those differences. But like I said, it's important that you work with a sports medicine doctor to come up with um, some some really in-depth strategies that might involve um, pharmaceuticals and light therapy. Okay, because uh, strength and conditioning specialists cannot prescribe uh, those things. I would imagine it's outside of their scope. So let's look at the pre-flight period. All right, so what are you going to do before you get on the airplane? You're going to hit the uh, airplane bar and down a couple of beers you think that's a good idea maybe if you're the coach <laughs> I don't know but maybe not I wouldn't um, because it's important for me to be extremely uh, fresh and uh, ready to rock just like I would ask of my clients and athletes so you want to plan that journey well in advance okay get yourself organized arrive in your destination well ahead of competition that seems to make sense doesn't it um, if you're going to travel eastward, so for example, um, going North America to Europe, an evening flight seems to be advisable. And this is from Riley's work from 2002. Okay. There is suggestion by Riley that the use of layovers for travel across 10 or more time zones is probably a good idea. So to, so to split the journey into two days with some type of overnight stopover, it might not always be practical. I mean, who knows who's booking um, itineraries, right? For clients and athletes. So, you know, keep that in mind, but if you can break things up, when I flew to, uh, when I flew to Malaysia from Vancouver, I laid over in Japan and it was eight hours to Japan and then eight hours from Japan to, uh, to Malaysia, to Kuala Lumpur, and that was perfect. I got a good night's sleep in Japan, basically went right back to the airport and um, continued the journey. So that might be an idea. Get sleep. So bank some sleep before your travel. What this does is it reduces your sleep debt or it pads your bank account of sleep. So if you can, get extra an hour of, of sleep a night for a good week after, before you head out on a trip. That's always a good idea. And you want to make arrangements for movement upon arrival. So even if that's a walk, all right? So let's imagine you arrive in your destination, you've been traveling, flying in the air for 12 hours, and you go straight into a car, or straight into a taxi from the, the baggage carrier. So, you know, you might want to 
make an arrangement to just go for a 20 minute walk at that point that you know might help with circulation digestion uh, etc it also seems that coping strategies or ability to deal with jet lag um, seems to be easier when one arrives later in the afternoon or, or evening maybe that's because the person is closer to bedtime um, but that was something that Riley discovered in his work so that's our pre-flight period. Now let's move into the in-flight period. The flight must be viewed as an opportunity for recovery. Okay, so rather than going, oh boy, this is going to be a horribly long flight. I'm not looking forward to it. Look at it as an opportunity with no for no distractions. Right? You're not maybe accessing the internet as easily. You um, you know really don't have the the space to do certain things. So why not rest? And athletes should learn how to rest without sleeping. So eyes closed, feet out, up um, in a comfortable position and, and literally just working on breathing, mindfulness, meditation. So what's important is the athlete creates a comfortable environment. Use pillows, use supports, make sure there's leg room for tall athletes, wear loose fitting clothing. A flight is not the time to wear, you know, extremely tight clothing that's restrictive or a belt, that sort of thing. Reduce stimulation. So I'm really big on minimizing a lot electronic devices. I'm big on investing in noise canceling headphones. They're worth the investment. They block out a ton of the noise on the airplane. You just need to be aware that if you need to hear announcements um, at the beginning of the flight, the uh, flight crew may not want you to be wearing them. And also bring some eye shades along so that way you can block out light if needed your sleep on board so should you sleep on the flight well it should mirror that of your destination schedule so let's imagine you're flying overnight and wherever you're going to it's also going to be night so this is the case where you might want to sleep you know a full six eight hours on the flight in this case a medically prescribed pharmacolo pharmacological intervention could be used but that has to be monitored and prescribed by a sports medicine physician that understands WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping uh, Drug Association. Okay, you cannot just go and take anything over the counter to help you sleep. You need to have your team doctor on board if that is the case. Now, some sleep medications help you sleep and don't have a long half-life for sleep, but they have a long half-life for muscle relaxing. So you can wake up, but you get there and your muscles are really relaxed. So that's no good. So that's why it's important to have um, a sports medicine on hand. So if it's, if it's night where you're going, sleep. Um, if you're supposed to be sleeping, do not eat so fast, okay? Uh, there is some evidence to suggest that if you take carbohydrates in the morning, that can advance the circadian rhythm. So in some, some cases, you may not want to be ingesting carbohydrates, but there's not a lot of really good concrete evidence on the nutrition side. And if you want more concrete evidence, I recommend speaking to a registered dietitian that works with athletes at an international level because they would have uh, knowledge in that, that area. Now, what about eating outside of not eating? Well, they do recommend to take some roughage to eat. So apples um, for digestion and alleviating constipation. Maintain hydration by drinking plenty of water, avoiding tea, coffee, and alcohol. Important to know when you are flying, the body does not sense dehydration. So you won't necessarily feel thirsty. So it's a good rule of thumb to drink more than expected. Periodically, get up to walk around the aisles about once every two hours. Perform stretches and you can also perform isometrics like contract a muscle and let it relax. Contract and let it relax. Do that for all the muscles in your body. You can do that without moving, right? You can do that in your chair. And that also helps to prevent traveler's thrombosis. Do not self-prescribe aspirin and you could also wear compression stockings as they do help. And that wouldn't necessarily require a prescription. Okay, upon arrival. So you've arrived, what should we do? Well, like I said, if, if you can, you know, sort of move a, move a bit, that would be good. Um, 
relax with a non-alcoholic drink. If you slept all night and arrive when it is morning in your destination, then caffeine is okay. So make sure that it is a, a good night's sleep. Like if you only got two hours of sleep on, on the flight and it was a night flight, you just couldn't sleep, you get to your destination, then you might not want to have any caffeine and you actually might want to have a sleep. So you're going to have to sort of play that by ear. You should take a shower. And as I mentioned, take a nap, but only if you're tired, feeling exhausted. If you're not feeling exhausted, it's not recommended that you take a nap. It's recommended that you go about the day and then go to bed earlier that night, which we'll get to. Now exercise. Exercise should be taken at the time of day of future competition. The sooner after the flight, the better in an ideal world, in a perfect world. Okay. Now, if your competition is at five at night and you arrive in the morning, then go with exercising the sooner after the flight, the better. Okay. It also helps to exercise outdoors to help you adjust, especially if you're getting natural light. Also important to heed whether or not you're traveling to altitude or to a hot, humid climate. So these two environmental factors will put a lot more stress on the athletes just outside of jet lag and travel fatigue. Um, it's beyond the scope of this lecture and this is where most high performance teams have sports medicine doctor or a team physiologist that will handle um, the environmental physiology, physiology adaptations. Okay, so if you're not familiar with that, you just need to know that both of those things are going to impact uh, recovery. Now, countermeasures are important, um, but need to be prescribed by a sports science professional, preferably a doctor. So scheduled light therapy and exposure, or on the opposite, light avoidance once you arrive. So you're either going to expose yourself to light or you're going to avoid light. So go in your hotel room, close the curtains, wear your eye mask from in the taxi, from the airport to your hotel, that sort of thing. Taking prescription melatonin, even though it is available over the counter in North America. Maybe the use of napping, maybe the use of caffeine. All of those countermeasures should be monitored and prescribed by a physiologist and or a sports medicine practitioner. Most strength and conditioning coaches don't have the expertise in this area unless they've done graduate work and have uh, have had been mentored, you know, sort of in this realm. So the management of, of these symptoms that an athlete faces is going to be individual. So therefore, the countermeasures will also be individual. So melatonin, as I said, should be prescribed, even though it's available over the counter. Now, interesting, what I came up with when I was reading Samuel's article, who's a Canadian, said that the purity of melatonin cannot be guaranteed over the counter. So some brands may work better than others. And if you're traveling into Europe, you actually may not be getting, um, you know, the same type of melatonin, if you will, as you would in North America. So melatonin has vasodilatory effects and it does help promote sleep without having major side effects when it's compared to benzodiazepines, which is another classification of drugs. But there are some unwanted side effects in some individuals with melatonin. So it's important that it is monitored and prescribed by a physician. It is typically normally taken in the evening in the new time zone. So you wouldn't arrive if you arrived in the morning in your new time zone and you wouldn't you wouldn't take melatonin at that point. Bright light opposes the action or suppresses our natural release of melatonin. So as you can see that those are your countermeasures, right? Light and melatonin supplementation. But guidelines for light exposure are beyond the scope of this presentation. So I hope that this was helpful and it gave you some guidelines. I think the major take home message here is that um, most strength and conditioning coaches um, do need to have some extra expertise in this area and not be afraid to ask questions and work with medical professionals to give your athletes the best guidance. And a little about me um, to say thank you. I'm a professor of kinesiology and a performance coach in Vancouver, as I mentioned. 
I have an undergraduate degree in physical education and a master's degree in science that's specializing in physiology and high performance sport. I've been fortunate enough to work um, in high performance in, in many different sports. I'm also the author of a training manual, a uh, training system called the Wrestler's Edge. And if you're interested in the Wrestler's Edge, you can go to fightcampconditioning.com and uh, download it from there. So thank you very much for your interest in this subject matter and uh, happy reading all the citations I provided. Take care.